Oh, hi. It's been a while, hasn't it? It's been, actually, you know, I would even say a little bit longer than a while, as it's been, you know, about a month, you know, since the last episode. But uh, the good news is, is that, uh, you know, everything went well. You know, uh, if you didn't catch the uh, the last episode or you were wondering, you know, where I've been at, uh, you know, I did have a, a little um, outpatient uh, surgery on my nose, and, you know, it's uh, it's coming along nicely. You kind of see the scar right there. It's actually a bit more pronounced in the lighting, you know, for the webcam than it is if you were to just see me in person. So I guess, you know, I got that going for me. Uh, but uh, it's good to be back. It's, it's definitely good to be back. Uh, you know, after after quite a bit of time going through doing a new, a new episode, and it's funny how everything is like going through and happening like all at once. You know, because I'm closing in on episode 200. You know, this is episode 199, probably. You know, my one of my favorite episodes because it has the it's tied for the most number of nines in the title uh, than any other episode that I've done on the show. Believe it or not. Um, that's just how math works, but uh, it, it it is one of those things that is like I've been having all of these other things, you know, between the the procedure and just other stuff, you know, going through and getting in the way. I do have some bad news to start the episode off in, and that episode two hundred is unfortunately going to also be delayed between just the timing of the episodes going and lining up, you know, with like Thanksgiving, Christmas. New Year's and all those other types of stuff. I have a couple of work events that are going to be coming up, which unfortunately are also kind of going to get in the way of some like Wednesdays and Thursdays and things like that. So I, I felt that instead of trying to like change dates, you know, rush things around, uh, I, I might just go ahead and put the show on a brief hiatus and then come back in the new year. Uh, so it, it is going to be a little bit of a longer break than normal, uh, between this episode and the next. I'm just, you know, going through and breaking the bad news now. Uh, but I do plan to record the, the big episode 200 on, uh, January 6th. And now I'm not just going to be sitting idle. I do hope that, you know, with, in that time, I'm going to be able to, you know, work on some stuff in order to, uh, maybe have a special guest or two on the show. Uh, to come and talk about the the history of the podcast, you know, and as well as uh, hopes and uh, dreams for the future, but but we'll see. I'll, I'll probably tweet out some more stuff, you know, as I solidify some plans and such. But you know, I'm not not just gonna be sitting around. I'll be making some use of my time, uh, you know, when we go through. And there there will be uh, a couple of exceptions though. Uh, just like with the quarter three developer blog, I will still intend to go and stream uh, for my direct feedback whenever they post the quarter four uh, Diablo 4 developer blog. Uh, so I will go through and at least uh, make time for that uh, whenever that might be. Depending upon when they actually release those notes, it might be, or that development blog, it might be uh, delayed by a day or two. Uh, depending upon what events I have going on at work or what have you. Uh, but I, I will do, you know, the episode 199.5 uh, at, you know, at that time, whenever they do actually go through and release that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, into the actual episode itself, you know, we've had quite a bit of news, you know, over the past month. Uh, you know, and rightfully so. It, it's, it's, it's been a while. I know. I know. I'm slacking. I'm slacking. But... To, to start things off, that there have been a couple of things that are, while not exactly Diablo-related, are Blizzard-related. And one of those big things is you had a uh, yet a new company from a couple months ago, back in September. You know, we had uh, Mike Morheim going in and announcing uh, Dreamhaven, as well as like the two sub-developers, uh, or the two sub-studios uh, underneath that, that would be going through and making some new games with some other big names like Dustin Browder and such, that uh, we now have another one with a whole bunch of StarCraft alumni forming a new studio called Frost Giant, which is going to be uh, making a big splash and a big return for RTS games. Now, besides StarCraft II and maybe uh, Total War Warhammer, there really hasn't been 
all that much uh, to do with the RTS genre in general. It used to be like the pinnacle of esports, but was, you know, completely overtaken by League of Legends and then later like Fortnite and other games of that nature. But, you know, there are still a pretty hardcore, you know, dedicated set of fans and communities out there that want more RTS games that still rally behind and love uh, StarCraft 2. Uh, and uh, it, it's cool to see that they're going through and they're being driven by their passions in, in order to go through and create a new studio uh, specifically designed for making an RTS. We don't really have uh, all that much details about you know what it is that they intend to do besides they're out like just straight out the gate. We're making an RTS game. Uh, you can even if you go to their website frostgiant.com, it says real time strategy returns. You know so. Uh, that that at least they have going for them because a lot of these other ones you know like some of the studios uh from you know like uh, the under the dream haven umbrella from mike morheim they're just like oh yeah we're going to be developing games so we don't have any idea what we're going to be doing we'll talk about that in the future uh or even from a couple of years ago uh bonfire you know from a lot of the diablo uh you know veterans that uh had left a blizzard uh right after reaper of souls had launched that they've been together for you know quite a for what it's almost like that studio formed like what almost three or four years ago and they haven't announced a single thing about what it is that they're working on though they continue to hire new people so obviously there is something going on in the background there uh that they're going through and working on as they lead up to whatever it is that the, the announcement of whatever it is that the game that they're working on and, you know, I guess to continue on that vein, we also had a recently Chris Metzen coming out and kind of like uh, officially announcing the end of his retirement. But, you know, not in the fashion that a lot of the people listening to the show are going to uh, maybe be interested in as much. And that he's going and he's created a new company called Warchief Gaming, which is, you know, taking the name, obviously, Warchief from Thrall and his dedication to the Horde and from his time at Blizzard. But the local wargaming tabletop community that he had created after leaving Blizzard was called Warchief Gaming, and they're taking some of the values that they had with their little gaming club into a company to make tabletop games. What form or fashion those take? Again, they haven't really said, and tabletop gaming can take a really uh, wide definition of games. Anything from... You know, your, your standard, typical, like, board games, like Settlers of Catan, or, you know, something else a bit more advanced, like Gloomhaven, uh, or Kingdom of Death. You know, you also have, you know, things that I'm interested in. Warhammer, uh, Warhammer 40k, Warhammer Age of Sigmar. And Chris Metzen, if you, if you follow his Twitter account, you can see how much of a nerd this guy is when it comes to Warhammer and tabletop wargaming. Uh, he's got so many armies that it makes me jealous like i don't e i don't even play majority of i i'm a dirty xenos player when it comes to 40k like, i don't care about the corpse emperor or chaos or anything like that i got my necrons i got my tyranids i got my gene stealer cults but that man's imperial guard he painted them all after gi joe like, pure mid-1980s Hasbro cartoon show, G.I. Joe, that filled me with so much nostalgia. He's got, he's got Sergeant Slaughter in the mix, and it's just, oh, I'm so envious. I wish, I wish I was that big of a nerd, I really do. But, you know, it, it is interesting to see him go through and come out of retirement. And he did also address, you know, kind of like, you know, maybe not the elephant in the room, but the unasked question with all of these people going through that are these big names that had left Blizzard that are finally going and rounding and coming back uh, into gaming. Uh, what was Metzen's plans? And he did address that in saying that that's just not in the cards for him at the moment, that he enjoyed his time at Blizzard and he does miss a lot of those aspects but going to work for um, a, a big corporation or even fulfilling a big corporate role and having to be responsible for other people and meetings and all that other types of stuff is, is, not, is not who he is at his core. And so he, he doesn't, he, that chapter of his life is over and yeah, it's not something that he's ever really planning on going back to. So 
Yeah. If you were a fan of Metzen's work and you like the kind of uh, creative talent that was uh, that drove uh, his passion and his stories, then uh, look to look to War Chief Gaming and the whatever you know tabletop game that they go through and come up with. A lot of the lore in the tabletop games and such is is actually pretty compelling. It's one of the things that really drew me in. Maybe not so much into Warhammer 40k. Nah, that's Space Marines. Nah. But uh, definitely Warhammer Fantasy and Warhammer Age of Sigmar, though I am biased towards fantasy settings more so than sci-fi. So, I mean, uh, you know, if you can forgive me for that little aspect. Uh, and then, I guess, kind of wrapping it more into actual Blizzard news, there was the the quarter three investors call recently where they did give you know some updates on diablo immortal and i'll talk about that later in the episode but one of the comments that was made uh in an interview outside of the conference call uh but in relation to you know the, the quarterly earnings uh there was a little you know kind of uh fast bite that uh bobby kotick you know the the ceo of activision blizzard uh, had to say that they they're doing so well that they've got so many games in the pipeline that they're looking to hire 2,000 more developers. And uh, I don't know about you, but you know I still remember from you know it's going to be soon two years ago when Activision Blizzard you know laid off like a thousand employees, uh, particularly like 800 employees from Blizzard itself mostly you know in community development communication and things things of that nature which uh really sucks that the industry continues to not see as developers and i'll, I'll fully admit i'm biased because you know some good friends of mine come from de community development from community managers and such and so i i will always consider them part of the development team that they're that the service that they do within the company and to the development team is just as important as any other aspect of going through and developing or, or making the game. Uh, but that's that's a kind of a, a tangent and topic for another time. But it is, it is one of those ones where, you know, th they had said two years ago that the reason why they had let go of all of those people was so that way they could focus back on uh, core development. And so they're getting rid of community managers so that way they can hire like producers or designers or what have you. Um, and I, I, you know, we've, I've gone over that, you know, countless times, uh, since, uh, that announcement. So I'll, I'll leave that one. But, you know, if, if you laid off all of those people so that way you could hire, uh, what you consider to be developers, why is it now that you're almost two years later and you are still needing more developers? while you know mr kotek and i'm sure that the rest of the board of directors continue to go home and with their lovely bonus checks and all that other uh great uh things for being corporate officers you know that that always when you go through and you make comments like that that just leaves a bad taste in everybody's mouth and it, it's it's also some of those things where as much as i love the the people at blizzard you know the the developers uh and you know everyone there especially the diablo team like every single person on the diablo team you know from from the people that control and meme on the twitter account you know all the all the way up to you know uh rod ferguson who's like kind of like in complete like production control of the the entire diablo franchise and all of its titles you know i i have faith in in confidence and all of those people but it does make it difficult to continue to be a fan of your company when you've got you know bobby kotick going through and making these you know soulless comments you know to try and curtail investors it, it's like you know it, it 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 is what it is you know so there there you have it uh, but moving on to, I guess, some better topics, uh, let's start talking about Diablo 3. Obviously, since the last episode, the, the PTR has ended, uh, the season, season 21 has ended, uh, the patch 2.6.10 is, uh, live, and season 22 is coming up very shortly, uh, and there, there weren't 
there weren't really too many changes that we saw from the patch notes when they went through and they posted you know the the beginning uh all, all of the announcement dates which is also one of those other ones which was really cool it was the first time that they did this is when they announced the end of season 21 and gave us the beginning date for season 22 they also gave us the patch date now that's something that was always left uh a little bit vague uh, as they would give the, give themselves, I guess, you know, some breathing room in case there were any last minute problems or changes that they had to make that might delay them deploying the patch. Usually it would be within the first of the two week waiting period in between the end of one season and the beginning of the next. Uh, you know, but it, it, ha it has varied a, a little bit over the past couple of years. But it is, it is at least the first time that they're going through and they're giving us the the dates right from the beginning and could definitely appreciate that anything that uh players or you know content creators and community members uh can do to better you know organize their time and plan out their stream schedules and such is a positive it just it helps out everybody uh so i'm uh, very thankful you know for uh, you guys going through, and by you guys, I mean, you know, uh, the people at Blizzard. So y'all uh, at Blizzard going through and, you know, getting whatever it was necessary in that kind of production pipeline to be able to, to better uh, fix those dates on the calendar beforehand in order to give us a heads up. Um, you know, and like I said, you know, since, since the last episode, I guess there have been some pretty big changes. You know, one of the ones that we had seen on the PTR was they substantially changed the Shadow Clones. One of the biggest complaints was that those Shadow Clones had hard CC built into some of the specs. Uh, and some, uh, some of those variations had damage boosting abilities that other ones didn't. So you would feel bad if you got one over the other. Uh, and they, they've largely curtailed all of that. Particularly, like, one of the big ones is, say, like, the Necromancer, where only two of the specs had frailty, uh, and one of them had early grave. So there was one that was just objectively better, regardless of how much damage any of the actual Shadow Clones did. There was one that was just objectively better from the get-go than the other two. Uh, and now all of the Necromancer Shadow Clones cast frailty early grave. Uh, so they're they're equal in that respect across the board uh, as well as with the removal of the hard CC skills uh, from the shadow clones I believe that the only last question was just how much damage overall are they gonna do uh, as we saw in season 21 the the full uh, power behind the season of the tempest wasn't fully realized uh, until people got their hands on it in the season. It took about a, a week or so uh, for them to like really figure out how to how to break it uh, to its fullest extent. And you know, I guess we just we haven't seen that if there's gonna be a similar similar state of play with the shadow clones. but the the community at least does with uh, the, the the devs listening uh, and modifying those skill builds on the clones. That the, the community is a lot more receptive and has a, a much higher uh, opinion, you know, of this particular season uh, and theme than anything else. And hey, fourth Kanai's cube slot—you can always fall back on that, right? Yeah, that that brings joy to everyone, and I hope it's popular enough that they keep it as a permanent option. Just, I'm just saying. But. Uh, Amongst that, there was one other kind of nerf, uh, and that was something that uh, SVR had actually tweeted out yesterday, was that it was an undocumented change. It wasn't a numbers change, but it was, it was a functionality change of how the uh, new Twister Wizard uh, was going to be playing in the, this new patch. But unfortunately, the behavior of the uh, the twisters has changed, so where that way you can't super stack them uh, as you were being able to on the PTR, which of course is going to overall neuter its damage and you know break the spec. So for all those all those wizard players out there, uh, you know you you were on the verge of greatness. You were this close, but it you know it wasn't complete and total greatness you know you but it, it was it was definitely one of those ones that was helping bring the the wizard back up there but uh yeah 
Uh, it's, uh, well, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, you know, I, I'm definitely excited, you know, for this particular season. I really enjoyed, you know, if you listen to me on the previous episodes or, you know, follow me on Twitter, you'll have seen that I was really digging, you know, the, the Mask of the Burning Carnival, the new uh, Bone Spear Simulacrum nec Necromancer set. And the fact that it's now getting a supplementary item to buff it further uh, has me even more excited. So I'm just going to play Necro again. Not like anyone wasn't expecting that in the first place, because I play a Necromancer the majority of the time anyways. Uh, but you combine that with the fact that they've now upgraded Hadrig's Gift, so that way all of the new sets that they came out with in the past couple of seasons is now been added into Hadrig's Gift, and they're all uh, in this season. So all of the new sets going all the way from the, the first two with the, uh, the, uh, the Monk Justice set and the, the Valor Crusader set to the Necromancer uh, you know, Burning Masks and the Demon Hunter G.O.D. build, uh, they're, they're all there. So you've got some that are really good. You know, Valor uh, continues to get nerfed. They had you know, the, the nerf to the, the Ivory Tower, which won't really affect you too much if you're just going to try and push to Guardian. Um, you know, you can you can easily the, the power of that set is still insane. You can easily go through and blow uh, blow through your entire uh, seasonal journey uh, with the the Crusader if you're going for it. Uh, the the you know versus you know the Typhon's Veil, vale, which is you know even even with some of the changes in this season is still needing some help in order to get there. It's not quite. It's getting better, but it's it's not quite there. Uh, and of course, you know, we've got the, the new seasonal rewards and I don't know about you, but I'm pretty excited. This, this is just cool. I mean, look, look at that pet. It's a walking book. How can you say no to it? It's so cute. So just little, it's got little scrolls. It's ready to go through and tell a story and follow you around. That's that's probably going to be replacing the uh, the Blood Golem for me as like my, my default pet at the beginning of every season once I go through and unlock that bad boy. So, uh, yeah, it, uh, things, things are definitely looking good. I, I have high hopes for this season. Uh, we'll see how much uh, things go because there, there are some, of course, uh, timing issues coming out with this one. You know, not just the holidays, but also like the launch of Shadowlands. Uh, amongst other things, uh, but uh, I I'm I'm looking forward to it. I I'm definitely still gonna go and dedicate uh, some time to it. Now I'll, I'll talk about that you know towards as we get to the the end of the episode. Uh, but yeah, you know that, that's that's pretty much it. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the the season opener on uh, November twentieth. Uh, I do intend, as I normally do, I will go through and do my usual, you know, once a season stream for the, the opening night uh, to go and get that done. Uh, but m maybe, you know, maybe I'll, I'll stream a little bit more uh, that weekend as time permits. We'll, we'll see. Like I said, we'll talk about it in a little bit. Uh, but, uh, you know, moving on, uh, continuing down the, the, the franchise, uh, we've got uh, some... Uh, news news on uh diablo immortal uh you know one of the the big things that the people that are really interested in diablo immortal myself included have been following is uh the google store updates now even though that the game hasn't been released uh as i've come to learn that the way that you can uh, kind of like deploy or test the app on the google store uh, is is you use like kind of like the same public facing functionality, but there's some sort of like back end uh, fl uh, account flagging that developers can do to allow you to download builds because the the build has been changing in the background as they've been uh, uploading like new versions of the game to it and it, it's been updating pretty uh, pretty consistently over the past couple of months you know either sometimes once a week sometimes once every two weeks or sometimes twice a week. Uh, and, you know, uh, Medieval Dragon over at BlizzPlanet has been uh, really on the ball about going through covering that and seeing it. What does this mean? Well, unfortunately, without too much context, we don't really know. 
uh, you know, obviously they're still working on the game, so them going through and doing the build updates shouldn't be surprising. Um, and they already announced that they were doing, you know, company-wide internal testing, which, as we learned on that conference call, uh, had extremely uh, positive and enthusiastic reviews from the employees, which, of course, you know, you're, it's an investor's call. that They're, they're going to go through and say that. But they're looking forward to expanding out to regional testing soon. And now, rewind this back three months ago on the show, I was considering, you know, when they changed the verbiage from regional testing to internal testing, did that mean that they might end up skipping some form of external testing for the game and just go straight to release? Uh, this, of course, answers that question, no. You know, that uh, that fear was, uh, uh, you know, that, that fear has been invalidated. We don't have to worry about that. Uh, but it, the big question still remains is what are they going to do as far as testing goes? And I, I've been trying to be very specific about saying regional testing and not beta testing because even though this is Blizzard's first mobile game, the mobile industry does things very differently. This is a topic I'm rehashing again, but just I think that it warrants repeating just because of the, the nature of the conversations I see around the web and Discord on Reddit and such. Uh, in that when you talk about uh, a regional test or a beta for a mobile game, it's not the same as what we expect on a PC game. There's not going to be uh, mass invites uh, or keys to, and things like that in order to be given away. Mobile gaming usually goes and just they they release the game in a smaller market like Brazil or the Philippines, uh, you know, and the, they just it's not even a beta. It's just here is the full game. It's for release. You can buy it, you know, or the microtransactions will be turned on or whatever it is. And it's just a full game. It's released in that region uh, and the developers are then going to pay attention to what's going on in it, collect feedback, metrics, and stuff before they go and then add, you know, uh, put in more updates, fix bugs and such before they go to uh, a wider or worldwide release. And so the, the reason why I constantly bring this up is because I see people going through and talking about the beta test as if they're going to be able to get in, especially a lot of people based here in the U.S., which, uh, you know, with uh, conversations I've had with people, you know, like Echo over at Echo Gaming, which he's 100% mobile, as well as some other people in the, the Diablo Immortal Discord, uh, the Reddit Diablo Immortal Discord, uh, that work within the, uh, the mobile games industry, is that you, you're really not going to see regional testing like in the U.S. It's just, it's just too big of a market in order for it to do. But people have been going around and doing research and such, and there are ways uh, that you know Blizzard could do individual invites, like I mentioned, like with that, the Google Store, or um, not not on the Apple side. There's there's a couple different ways of doing it. There's like test flight, but that's for much smaller scale stuff. It only lasts for a limited period of time. You can only have like a hundred users, uh, but they have a bigger scale like develop. Uh, development betas that they can go through and roll out um, and I can't remember what that what that process is called but there are ways that they can go through and distribute the game uh, to select people in order to beta test the game but Blizzard hasn't mentioned anything about that kind of testing the only external testing that they've ever talked about has been regional testing and so just uh, you know managing expectations uh, uh, you know, uh, hope for the best, expect the worst, you know, type thing, uh, is, is that we will probably see the regional testing open up for Diablo Immortal, uh, maybe not this year, but early next year. Uh, and it will be just a, a fully launched game, uh, you know, in one of those, one of those, you know, key markets that they use for testing, you know, such as Brazil, Philippines, I think like Australia, India, or some of the, the big, more popular ones that a lot of companies will use or fall back on. You know, Echo said that even like in Canada, uh, they'll uh, sometimes you know open that area up for regional testing, uh, and we'll see. You know, uh, that that's something that I know. Looking outside of Blizzard, 
uh, I believe Riot has been having some problems with with uh, Wild Rift. Uh, that there have been so many people going through and downloading VPNs to try and get into the regional beta, you know, for that game to test it out. That they've had to block, you know, IP addresses. Uh, the IP addresses used by some of the more popular VPN networks because they they have far more users going through and playing the game than they were expecting for the limited regional testing that they were doing and it's ruining the test you know it's making it so that the game is unplayable and people can't test the game in the first place because so many people are excited to go through and try it out we'll we'll see what we'll see what the devs go through and have planned for immortal uh but i of course continue to go through and look forward to it uh and for uh diablo 4 quarter four dev blog win I, I know we're we're technically only like we're not even a month and a half into the the quarter but it is it is quarter four is always one of those weird times uh for uh blizzard uh where you kind of have either rushed or elongated development cycles uh, because you've got the holidays, you know, a lot of people take vacation, uh, like a week vacation for Thanksgiving, and, and Blizzard has notably over the years uh, almost encouraged uh, a lot of the staff to go through and more or less take one to two weeks off, and the Blizzard campus kind of just shuts down for like the last two weeks in December. So, you know, it, it's, I, I imagine that we'll probably uh, get uh, this developer update a little bit sooner then we have the last couple of ones you know if for if for nothing else that they'll probably kind of be ramping down uh the studio and people will just be getting ready to go take vacations uh or i guess in this particular climate staycations uh, uh as they you know kind of transition you know into uh just you know this is just kind of like a yearly thing that happens at blizzard uh, so I, I hope that we'll we'll see that uh, quarter four development blog uh, within you know like the the first or second week in December, it, it's this is going to be the big one. This is going to be itemization, you know that they they promise that they're going to talk about. So I I also equally would not be surprised if we don't get that quarter four development update until early January, just because this is one of those ones that a lot of people in the community are waiting on, and is one of those kind of like keystones that they have to get right. You know, this, this is like one of those big ones that if you look at the feedback for Diablo 4, the vast majority of the feedback from, you know, the community has been positive, but there's always been those big questions over items. There's been, you know, back and forth and such uh, on, you know, the skill trees and complexity versus simplification and what have you. There, there's arguments for both sides, but one of the big ones has still been you... You gotta show us. You gotta show us better items, Blizzard. You you gotta do it. Uh, so this this is a big one. This, this is gonna be a big one. Uh, we we're gonna we're gonna be go we're gonna begin to see some of that because they've been talking a little bit about items. They've been talking a little bit about skills. Uh, you know, over the the last year worth of updates, as you know, we've you know officially surpassed a, a year since the announcement. Um, and this will kind of like be one of those ones where they'll they'll have a an opportunity to kind of show us what it is that they're really working on. Show us what those in-game items look like. Uh, is, to my knowledge, uh, the items that they showed, not in last quarter, but quarter two, were actually all like level 20 items that you, you would have found in when they were doing that uh, zone preview for that, that play to that internal play test that they had for the dry steps that you know that was like that general area that they were you were around like level 20 and so they were showing what the stats would be like for level 20 items or about halfway through the game uh, maybe in this dev blog we'll see some in-game items we might see hopefully what the actual difference is between legendaries and sets since there's been some ambiguous descriptions of what they've talked about with legendaries and sets maybe we'll see a new iteration for mythic items you know how are sockets and you know gonna work uh have they made any noticeable changes to runes or the uh, rune word system uh, that they had previewed are we going to see a gym we we have no idea what gyms are they were briefly kind of like described at blizzcon as they would kind of be stat increases uh 
you know, but it was uh, the question, the follow-up question was, of course, well, how do you make just regular stats compel against, you know, uh, mechanical systems such as the, the runes that had some play to it between, you know, what you would be, you know, activating, you know, how you can activate them, how you choose your activating trigger and then the effect that comes with it versus just stats. You know, one one's interesting, one is static, not not as interesting. But then in the item updates that we've seen is some new affixes that increase the bonus of gems in sockets. But we haven't seen any mentions of runes. So are they going to talk about that in the blog? And then also in how much detail are they going to go into? The community is expecting everything. They're going to want a 50 page you know, design document on every single nuance of every item from your level one cracked sash to your level 40 or level 50 you know in-game mythic item that dropped from a you know level four keystone dungeon uh or something along those lines and that's that's you know that that's what they want but uh how much are they going to go into with blizzcon line coming just a couple of months later in you know uh, the middle of february this you know things to think about things to consider but uh the the community is waiting with bated breath on this one because items are just so important to the core mechanics uh of the game and you know it's been one of the the bigger sticking points for some of the more traditionalist arpg players or the the people that really enjoy diablo 2 uh, that just could not get into diablo 3 uh that they they want uh more complicated you know, maybe not even, that's not even like the, really the, the right word. Uh, they want a more in, in engaging item system. I mean, definitely they want something that's more uh, engaging, but they just, they, they want something a bit more than just, well, this one has 50 more strength on it. Uh, so just equip it. You know, they, they want, you know, faster hit recovery, faster cast speed, and other things like that to factor into those into those decisions, into those equations. Um, but, you know, speaking speaking of Diablo 2, uh, we do also have a, a little bit of news on Diablo 2. There is a, a fan-made project called Project Diablo 2 uh, that they just recently launched. And this is something that you can, if you want to check out, uh, Mr. Llama SC has been doing a massive amount of streaming uh, on this, you know, since it's released recently. Uh, and so uh, check out his stream if you want to go through and see more of it. But it's kind of the best way I could describe it is it's a modernization of Diablo 2. So it's not like something that you've seen with some other uh, versions where, oh, you know, someone's working on making Diablo 2 in the Unreal Engine or someone's making Diablo 2 in like the, the StarCraft Engine. This one is a mod of Diablo 2. Uh, where they've gone through and they've made uh, not just like quality of life improvements like Pluggy, uh, you know, they're going to be adding in uh, ladders, they're adding in new skills, they're adding in, you know, skill reworks, they're adding in new affixes, they're changing the functionality of how certain things or certain affixes work within the game. Uh, you know, they're, they're you know, uh, adding in uh, kind of like a, a mapping system or a rift system, you know, uh, you know, a la Path of Exile or Diablo 3. So there, there's a lot of things that they're going through and doing to try and make Diablo 2 uh, basically modern and competitive with other ARPGs that have released since. Uh, and if you want, you can go through, you know, uh, check out the, the website. You know, uh, they, they go through, they've got ladders that they'll be going and having, so you're going to have your seasons uh, with different themes and bonuses and new balances and such uh, to go through and check out. Uh, and it is funny because I do, I do have to acknowledge one thing because they go through, it is a mod for and by passionate Diablo 2 fans. We aim to maintain the Lord of Destruction experience and provide consistent ladder resets while improving on the game as if development never ceased. And now, you know, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, it's one of those ones. Not saying that the developer or the people that worked on this project are, but you know, when you when you think, if you go on say Reddit and you think about someone that is very passionate about Diablo two, you know, they they hate Diablo three. They really hate Immortal. 
It's just I, I love the fact that they used you know the immortal graphic art for the website you know for the Diablo 2 project. To me, that's just one of those ones where it's just it, it, it's just perfect. You know, to see you know immortal artwork on this big Diablo 2 project, uh, it just it's like at least. They, I know they know where that artwork came from, but they, they decided to go through and put it up there anyways. So, you know, kudos to you guys, you know, that went through and put together the website for, for not being afraid to, to use some assets from, you know, Immortal. I mean, because I, I still continue to this day get hate, you know, for Immortal because I am the lore guy that asked a lore question at the lore panel. Go go figure i don't know different different story different time uh but yeah uh in also maybe related to diablo 2 is if you go back to the middle of the year there was those rumors of a uh diablo 2 remake you know that was potentially in production uh, not in not a remaster, but like a remake. Diablo II Resurrected, I believe, is what its name was. And as time went on and people did some digging, you know, this name Vicarious Visions kept going and popping up because they've been handling the remakes and remasters of a lot of other Activision titles. And so that was one of those ones that was kind of pegged as, well, maybe they're working on the D2 remake. And, uh, like, a. Uh, a couple of months ago they hired uh, a QA tester that was specifically uh, comfortable that specifically called out that you had to be comfortable of working with uh, mature themed video games uh, particularly like M rated titles and that job was filled or removed but has since come up you know I believe like just within the past week uh, they have reposted a new job for another QA tester that is comfortable it's working on mature titles and when you think about that you look at say activision's um you know portfolio of games well they've already been kind of going and you know remaking and redoing you know like the the call of duty games so that doesn't really make sense to pull from there what what other things in activision blizzard's portfolio would be like mature rated and big diablo 2 maybe who knows? I mean, there, there's definitely... It, it is it is somewhat reading in between the lines. Uh, and so you could be reading something that's not there. But, you know, last year when uh, Blizzard and GOG... Uh, or, you know, CD Projekt Red, who runs GOG... Uh, you know, made the, the deal to release Diablo 1. As well as, like, you know... Uh, some other like the the older Warcraft titles and stuff you know on their platform people are like well why not Diablo 2 and it's still like Diablo 2 is like still one of the most uh, requested titles for them to add to GOG uh, and they didn't do it why not and they you know they might not want to release it on another platform if they're working on a full remake themselves right right yeah yeah so you know there's there's some there's some clues you know they they you know that it might just be you know footprints in the snow but it's you know who knows so sometimes you know sometimes tea leaves are right right but uh yeah and that that kind of like wraps up a lot of the diablo news but there are just some kind of like uh general stuff uh such as you know uh shadowlands is coming out soon uh, so that actually launches on the 23rd and there's a, a lot of people uh, that they have uh, some uh, some like kind of like conflicts of interest going on there. I know this is one that uh, Bloodshed was talking about recently because uh, he plays World of Warcraft in addition to Diablo and a bunch of other titles. And when you release the new season on the 20th and then Shadowlands on the 23rd, like that that's really asking to go between people's times. I know that the teams themselves act independently of one another and they they're not beholden to the release dates of any other team's projects. It is like one of those ones where it's like Blizzard, could you please just spread this out a little bit, please? Uh cuz I I have 
I know. I'm sorry. I've been playing World of Warcraft. I just... I really enjoy PvP. I'm not that good at it, but I just... I really enjoy PvP. And it, it's been going through pulling me back. The the, the pre-patch is absolutely terrible. Um, because it's, it's either you roll somebody or they roll you. And there's no in-between. There's no, like, good fights. You know, and, I, and I'm playing an Unholy Death Knight, which is... You know, they're not... They're not, like... The most broken specs in the game you know currently but they're 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 up there they're really powerful you know every everyone has like some sort of combo where you can just kill somebody in like three globals uh but it, it, it i guess it does get fun in a 2v1 situation where i just explode one guy you know i explode i try to explode the other overpowered class so that way then it's just like hey you're just a feral druid you know, I could take you. <laughs> so let me let me kill your ret paladin friend here, and then the two of us can fight when I have no cooldowns, and now it's a brawl, right? Um, and that's coming from someone who, self-admittedly, I'm not that good, uh, just to give you a state of the game right now. But it's like, I'm not... It, it's... When you PvP in an MMO, like, yeah, there's not going to be a fine level of balance there. There, it's it's going to be rock paper scissors, and you you just have to acknowledge that. And I do, and that allows me to have fun with it. Um, and there are a lot of things that can go wrong in Shadowlands. There are so many things that can go wrong in Shadowlands, but it's the expansion of death. Where I get to be, you know, a necro lord and walk around in bone armor on my unholy DK and raise all these undead minions. You know, it just... It calls to me. It really calls to me. And so I'm, I'm gonna go through and give it a chance. And that's what I was talking about earlier on the episode. Where, you know, depending upon how my schedule works out and all of that and how I can handle some projects at work... I might take a day or two off that week and if I do deep dive uh, into Shadowlands at launch uh, I you know I might try to stream it uh, I, I am gonna be in a party with some friends and such so I've, I'm obviously gonna try and clear it with them if they're okay uh, being on stream and such but you know I, I will probably try and uh, stream a little bit of the Shadowlands opener um, and how how we go through you know and we you know, we'll, we'll see how that goes I know I know you're listening to this for a Diablo podcast and not for uh, me talking about World of Warcraft. But to then bring it back to, you know, friends and Diablo, uh, as, as you may know, I have been a guest on a previous episode of the Dinctuary podcast, which is uh, a, the brand new podcast. It's kind of like making some big waves within the uh, community because it involves pretty much every single name that you can think of from the Diablo content creator community uh, is in there uh, or is going to be in there. Uh, and I just recently had the opportunity to come back on the show again. We just wrapped up uh, this past weekend uh, with episode six of the Dank Shory podcast. I was again invited back onto the show, but this time it was to talk about something a bit more fluffier and that was BlizzCon. And my God. So... Full warning, if you want to go through and listen to it, it is over three and a half hours long. But it's myself, Steven, uh, Tim from the Cool Story Bro podcast, Riker, and uh, Dainty, Brandy, uh, was on there uh, in order to go through and add a different aspect of, you know, everyone is, out, any content creator has always talked about BlizzCon and how great of an uh, how great of like an adventure that it is, uh, but we never really got to hear the side of someone that works there, and so it was really cool to have Brandy on the show uh, and talk to the differences of what it's like, you know, on the other side of the screen, you know, being there and you know working on uh, BlizzCon and the, the the stress and the hours that are put into it, you know, going and leading up there, um, and you know. The, the collection of everybody on that show, you know, we're, we're all, you know, not just friendly, but like friends, you know, we, we've had every on everyone on that show, we've more or less had have had impacts on each other's lives. And it got it got emotional. It really did. I'm, I'm beginning to uh, tear up just even thinking about 
you know, the, the stuff that we talked about on that show and kind of is the reason, you know, for the title of this episode, you know, the feels are reals uh, because I, I'm still kind of coming off that high. And even though like there was a lot of tears shed, it was, it was all from a positive place. And it does kind of suck that there wasn't a BlizzCon this year. And just the way that the world is, there's a, there's a chance that there might not be a BlizzCon next year. Um, if it's still, you know, not safe to have 40, 50,000 people contained within a small confined area. Um, uh, it is, uh, it, 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 it was a, a great joy and it, it's had me thinking, uh, over the last couple of days of just going back and looking at all of the things that I remember and I love of the Diablo franchise. Uh, and, you know, going back to rewatching, you know, those D2 cinematics and how back in 2000, 2001, those were the greatest CG, you know, art that had ever been created in the history of time. And, you know, it doesn't, doesn't quite hold up, <laughs> you know, 20 years later, but yeah, it's, that's just that, it, that it, that's how it goes, you know. Uh, it, it is just, you know, going back and like booting D2 back up and, and checking that out and just listening, like the music that's playing right now and that that's going and, you know, riffing it and there's just so many thoughts and feelings come back and are triggered the amount of nostalgia that's triggered by that. And then going and like watching the D3 announcement video and like all the stuff that they showed that didn't make it in the game, like they showed they showed um, Ure, you know that that city I've talked a lot about that I want to visit in Diablo Four. Um, you know, a, a different type of you know the, that the clip of Ariat Crater that never made it in game and a whole bunch of stuff and you know uh, some of the D three cinematics and some of the even just. Even just like when I started up the uh, the pre-show for this episode, I opened up because on the episodes I a lot of times played the D2 soundtrack because it's just one of my favorite uh, pieces of music ever, you know, just ever. Um, you know, to change it up a little bit, I played some of the Diablo 3 soundtrack and like when it hit like that Reaper of Souls or in, like or the Diablo 3 overture and then into Reaper of Souls, and it was just like going through and thinking about that. And it was just like the, that overture in that like being up at like 5 a.m. in the morning watching the Worldwide Invitational in 2008 when they announced Diablo 3 and how super stoked and excited I was reliving those memories and those visions and then you know uh hearing the Reaper of Souls music and like that that amazing opening cinematic and like the Reaper of Souls launch party and all those other things and positive stuff it was just so cool and then like just going back and, and watching for like the hundredth time, probably in the last six months, the by three they come, the Diablo Four cinematic, and I, I'm already thinking about what what memories does this game contain, you know, and it's just like how how much you know I love Diablo and, and everything that you know it, it it's done for me, you know, and the impact that it's had on my life, you know, just from being a, a podcaster, a content creator, the the friendships, the amazing friendships that I've made throughout the community, like across across the ocean, different countries and stuff like that. And how uh you know, how how really thankful I am, you know, for for having gone and, you know, developed all those things. And you know, maybe maybe also you know, if you go through and you look at all that crap on that back shelf there, you know, maybe you know, the financial ruin that it has brought me to of being a sucker for all the collector's crap just because I, I have to own it. You know, maybe maybe that one's not a positive <laughs> memory. But uh, it still is just, uh, man, it's, it's a great thing. I, I'm very, very thankful, you know, to at least be, you know, kind of in this position and to have you all, you know, listening to the show or watching the show on YouTube or watching it live here on Twitch. Uh, that I, I definitely uh, appreciate you all and I 
I want to do better. You know, uh, I, I've had uh, my passion stoked. It, it's been a rough year, needless to say, you know, for for all of us, for, for everyone. I don't know. I, I've not talked with anyone that hasn't had their life impacted in some way, you know, by just the everything that's been going on in 2020. Uh, but I'm, I'm hoping to turn some of those things into positive into, to do more, to do better as a, a content creator, uh, and a, uh, a member of the community. Uh, so like, like I said earlier in the episode, uh, I'm not just going to be sitting by, you know, for the, the next, uh, like month and a half or next two months really, um, by between now and the next episode. And so I, I hope uh, I hope to have some cool stuff and some special stuff for episode 200. Uh, and already, you know, uh, shout out to Longshot on that one. Because uh, he's kind of like the archivist, you know, for the Westmarks Workshop. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to be working with him to go through and get some uh, little little tidbits uh, and clips and, you know, metrics and memories, you know, from the past 200 episodes. But uh, hopefully I'll be able to have, you know, some familiar faces on the show uh, from yesteryear. You know, but we'll see. No promises on that one. You just have to work out with scheduling and such. But also just from, you know, my, myself, you know, as a, a, a content creator going through and uh, doing more. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's been this last couple of days, man. It's just been a trip. And I, I am so uh, infinitely thankful for uh, SVR, Riker, and Rax for getting their passions in order uh to go and produce something like Dangshuary uh in order to take the the entire community because it's it's something that you see so often and this isn't just this, uh, this isn't about the Diablo community but it's something that you see so often in so many other creative spaces not just in gaming uh but anywhere that it's um individual voices that are trying to make themselves heard more and it makes collaborative efforts uh, something about like who can kind of talk the loudest or uh, I just I'm looking for another venue to share my voice instead of adding my voice to it. Subtle difference uh, if you if you understand what I'm saying. Uh, but there are some things uh, that are out there where it is a purely collaborative effort. And it's not about elev elevating any one particular person. Um, and that's something that, you know, uh, I, I've really been inspired by uh, with the, the crew over there at Dangshuary, what they're going through and doing. Because it's not about um, any one person. And even though Riker, Rax, and SVR are the creators of the show, there have been plenty of episodes where there's only like one of them on there. Uh, to to go through and kind of like host the event and they let the other people go and talk and have the floor um, and so it's um, you know, it's really cool what they're going through and doing and, and trying to make uh, something for the community that that's better than its collective parts so by all means you know maybe maybe that three three almost four hour episode isn't for you you know that's that's fine, but the, you you want to go through and check it out. If you're more, if you're if you just want those hard numbers, you know the Dangshuary they've got those in depth, you know super theory crafting uh, episodes even just already. Uh, you want some uh, fluffier, more light hearted topics? You you've got it. You want some emotional, impactful drama? Well, we we got you on that one too. Or even just like some thoughts. And uh, thoughts and expectations uh, about you know what the what the future might hold, or even thoughts and opinions of the Diablo franchise from outside of the franchise, going out to like Path of Exile and such. Dangshuri has got you there, so please, by all means, um, check it out, give it a try. You you will not be uh, you will not be disappointed uh, if you want to go through and check out Dangshuri. So please. Uh, give it a click. Give it a listen. It, it's out there. It's it's everywhere. iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, uh, you know, uh, YouTube, uh, and Twitch. They also stream all the episodes live on Twitch. So please check it out. Uh, and with that, it uh, it finally goes and brings me to the uh, the end of the episode here. 
and again, even though I literally just spent, you know, the last couple of minutes going and saying it, I do truly appreciate um, you all being a listener for the show. Uh, and by all means, if there's anything that I can do better or any thoughts, feelings about the, the show or even just Diablo in general, you want someone to go through and look over and, you know, air, uh, air your opinions, please feel free. Drop me a line. Westmarchworkshop at bluespro.com, you know, or follow the show on Twitter, the WM Workshop. You can also follow me on Twitter at uh, NineBallGamer. Uh, otherwise, you know, you can find the show here. I record the episodes live at twitch.tv slash blizzpro. Uh, normally, it's every other Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. But, like I said at the beginning of the episode, in case you missed it, uh, there is going to be a brief hiatus uh, for the holidays between work and all this other stuff. Uh, I've just, a lot of my middle weeks, unfortunately, are going to be spoken for. And uh, I'm going to be putting the, the show on a brief hiatus, even though I know I just had one until January 6th. So, I look forward to seeing you there. Uh, we will talk again soon whenever we go through and we have that developer for blog. I will do an impromptu episode on that one just to go and cover that and give my feedback. Uh, but um, I wish you all uh, happy holidays, happy Thanksgiving for those uh, in the, the U.S. here. Uh, and I will, I will catch you all soon. <laughs>